It's the union rules. Okay. So I have no idea. Could, uh, could you cancel out the CNs and when you get it left with a C, could you, like, back No, you'll be careful. This isn't like C to the N plus 1 over C to the N. That's not what that is. Okay. This is, uh, if CN was N factorial over N minus 4 or something, what would CN plus 1 be? Good. So the ratio of those, the factorials could cancel here. These wouldn't cancel, but they have no relationship to C itself in any way. Do you guys kind of see? I mean, it totally depends on what that actually is. And I don't know what the hell it is. And why is that okay? What's the question asking about? The question is asking about this. And am I not going to almost get that? It's interesting. Notice one thing. The, the question is how related to what I have so far. It's the reverse. And I'm going to see why here in a minute. So this equals uh, the limit of, I have no idea what the hell that is, times, yeah, because n of these cancel out, right? Is that cool? Yeah. That part I could do with all day long, because they know what the hell that is. And of course, in order for that to do anything, it's got to be, <laughs> right, less than one, because it's sort of like geometric. Remember, so it's got to be less than one that R. Yeah. Okay, so what could you do from here? So I have here the limit that goes infinity of CN plus one over CN. Times X minus A, I mean, what's the limit as N goes infinity of this? Yeah, it just comes out, right? It's like a constant according to this limit. Is that cool? So that piece is this. If I set this less than one, what could I do from there? All right. Uh, what am I trying to get? This is the reverse of what I want, really, right? Sure. You can, okay, you can divide by x minus a as long as x is not equal to a. You could do that, sure. But does that do much for you? No? So in order for this to equal the radius of convergence, so it's got to equal, uh, you know, well, we don't know what the radius of convergence is going to be, right? But, all right, let's see what we've got here so far. So, so far we've got, let me take some of this weirdness away. Just, we've got this here. So that's definitely what we have so far from the limit. <coughs> and we know, and then of course the next step that kind of makes sense, hopefully, is I can take that x minus a out because it's not dependent on n. So let me do this for you. Let's call this L. Okay? We'll call that L just so we don't have to carry that whole thing around with us. So then I end up with, I'm forgetting my little absolute value in this, so I get absolute value of x minus a times L, and that's gotta be less than one. So now if we do like, because all said, maybe it looks a little bit better, we'll see. I mean, what do I do from here? I mean, so remember, do you remember getting to the end of one of these problems and you get something like this here? Maybe it's x minus 1 or something. And then what do you do next? You divide by 3. And then do the, the whole thing where you rewrite the absolute value inequality, right? right? So if I do divide by this L, and I think the, the weirdness here is... Oh, 
reciprocal. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's maybe the weird part. I don't know if that's the weird part. Um, in, in general, the one over the limit of a ratio. So if I wanted to know uh, n over n, well, let's get some more interesting. n over n squared plus one. The limit of that is definitely going to be what? Zero. So one over that would go to infinity. And, that, and that's exactly what the <coughs> reverse of that would do, right? So, or if I do, uh, the limit as n goes infinity of 2n over 2n. No, Jeff, something more interesting. 5n plus 3. That's what? Two fifths. So of course, 1 over that should do what? 5 over 2, and that would be the limit of the reverse, right? So it's kind of a cool property. You actually, the one over the limit of a ratio is the limit of the reciprocal of the ratio, right? Because whatever the answer is going to be, it would just get reciprocated. You guys kind of with me? So you can totally do that with this limit. So again, if I have, uh, what is one over L? That's one over the limit, and goes infinity of, oh, I took it away. Cn plus one over Cn. Yeah, which becomes limit n goes infinity of cn over cn plus 1. So this 1 over l is the limit as n goes infinity of cn over cn plus 1. So that is the radius, isn't it? The center would be a, and how far do you go out from there? Whatever this number is. So that does act as the radius of convergence. Well, what's they're asking? They're asking to show that it equals the radius of convergence, and that's how you do it. It's got to be on that. So, in general, we sort of talked about this, but let me give you a few examples in a row here. So, if I had, um, I mean, so if I just had this, the radius of convergence is obviously one. Good. I make sure that's obvious. Just doing this, does that change the radius? No, it doesn't. It changes the center. The center is now 3, but I, I want to go out 1 from there, right? So the radius is still 1. So the only way I can really change the radius of convergence is to have some multiplier here. Cool. So if I had 3 times x minus 3 is less than 1, so the actual radius would be one third. So here, I mean, let's see if I'm still somewhere here. So I have x minus a times this guy, less than one. So what should the the radius be? It should be the reciprocal of that, because I would divide by. It. And how do you reciprocate a limit? You just reciprocate the thing inside of it. So the way that started. Those kind of problems, I don't know, the important thing to get from that problem is how do I even start to attack it? And you don't know shit about C. So I understand when you first read through that, you're like, how the hell? Do I just make up something for C? No, it's bad. It's too specific. It's got to work no matter what C is. So then you say, what would I do if I had a problem like this? I would just do the ratio test to try to figure out the radius and the interval. That's where they would come from. So that's your next thing to try. You're not even sure if it's going to work. You're just going to try it and see what you get. Then I felt like you guys weren't really sure about how this would work. But it is true. The, the one over this limit would just be the limit of the reciprocal of the inside. It's kind of cool. Maybe, maybe, maybe. And, and real quick, let me, let me, some of you guys may not need this proof, but if I had this, If I had this, couldn't I just take the limit inside and put it downstairs, right? And, uh, but what is this equal to? This is equal to the limit of n, as n goes infinity, of just g over f. Is that cool? So the way I've written it right there, I can just take it back to this. 
Or I could say, okay, this is one over the limit as n goes infinity of f over g. So the reciprocal of this is the limit of the reciprocal on the inside. There you go, we just proved it. It's all because I can take the limit inside this reciprocating function. I can take the limit inside of it because it's continuous on its domain. Okay, cool, maybe. So that problem I think was just weird as to where to start with it. You just attack that series directly, like you normally would any of them. Okay, yeah. Oh yeah, all right. I forgot to look back. I think somebody confirmed this for me. I keep forgetting to look back, but on an earlier thing, I had a, like a tangent sequence and you had to figure out the limit. And you just, tangent's continuous, so is cotangent, so you can just take the limit inside. So what does it have to do with a series now? What's the first thing you look for in a series? Yeah, you test to see if it's divergent. If it's divergent, that kicks ass. You have to worry about it, you're done. So I don't know if this thing diverges just by looking at it. So I'm going to actually take a second and check it. Right? I can't just see. You got to take a second to look. So when you take the limit of the inside of that cotangent, what do you get? Almost. Yeah, this would be. 3n pi over 1 minus 9, so the degrees are the same here, so it would be 3 over negative 9, 3 pi over negative 9, so it's negative 3 pi over 9. And of course the important thing about that fact, the limit of the cotangent of stuff, I can take the limit inside because cotangent is continuous. <laughs> and I, I was kind of surprised that we were freaked out about that because we do that all the damn time. Let me give you a really easy example. Hopefully it's easy enough that you don't even realize the weird thing you're doing. If anybody was in my office recently, you understand, you've seen this. That's easy, right? What is it? Yeah, there's no trick here. It's three. What did you do? You put a four in. How did you do that? Because you took the limit inside because the square root's continuous. You do it without even realizing that you're actually taking the limit into a function. You're taking the limit inside the square root. Your brain doesn't say you're doing it. Your brain just says, you put a 4 in. <laughs> but you're doing that because you actually took the limit inside. So here, I'm just going to take the limit inside. Cot function is nice and continuous on its domain. Yeah, I was making that a lot harder. It yeah, it's not. Making it harder is not hard to do. And this, the important thing about this again is it's. What's the important thing about this? It's not zero exactly. I almost don't care what it is. It's just not zero. So therefore, it's divergent. I love it. It doesn't even have a chance. The sequence doesn't even get out of its way at all. So it doesn't even have a chance. Yes. Sir. Yeah. Let me tell you, let me do this just to save myself some time. I don't think anybody's going to necessarily be doing this in class. So let me go ahead and give you the answer key. Because so it just hit me, I'm like, I already did this. Oh, yeah.
I think this is, uh, I didn't steal this from the homework. I think there was a problem in homework. It was like e to, the one over n, e to the 1 over n over n squared, right? Yeah. Somebody just came to ask me about that question. I forgot that question. Um, but e to the 1 over n, what's beautiful about that number is, considering the n starts at 1 here, the largest that could be is e, right? Uh, when n is 1. Once n starts getting 2, 3, 4, now you're taking larger and larger roots of e. So that's going to get smaller and smaller. So this is basically a constant divided by n cubed. And that's beautiful, right? So the way to make it official, you got to do a direct comparison. Once you start thinking like that, this is like less than this. So it looks like this kind of piece. Then that your brain's trying to tell you, do a direct comparison. Do exactly what you just said. This is always less than this. Since this bigger dude converges, I must converge. Yeah. Oh, cool. That's a little bit like uh, one of the problems on the practice test. All right, so on this one, they probably ask me for the radius. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, of course, unless it's obviously like a root test, I'm going to do the ratio test. Yes, sir. So, on number 24, they, they just set the problem up differently. And I guess on this one, they just did the uh, ratio test. Yeah. How do you know to use either of the two? Because last class here, you said something about the two, the four, and the six are all missing. So how do you set up the top to compare this to the bottom? Does that make sense? Was it this one we were looking at? Yeah, it was. How far do we make it with this? can't remember. So we did start this one. Did we set up the ratio test and all of that stuff? Or? Yeah, we were just going to work on it. I thought you said you couldn't use the ratio test. Oh, that's right. This is the one I was supposed to work on. I completely forgot. <laughs> <laughs> totally fine. Yeah. I'll tell you. I'll. Did this one because you did the ratio test and canceled out all of it? Yeah, there was a slight. Was there a problem somewhere? I can't remember. There was a problem. Let's see what happens. I can't remember now. Uh, so now they're all in the future. Let's see what happens. Yeah, that's what I was trying to do. Yeah, that's what I was trying to do. Is that cool by itself? Yeah. Okay. We started off the show that, and then times up here, a lot of stuff is going to cancel. So this is just me catching up with what we did last time. Uh, so here, this will be n plus one times n, so the n factorials go away. Here, n of these go away. Here, this whole first part goes away. Everybody see where that 2n plus 1 came from? Mm -hmm. Just plug an n plus 1 in there. Right? So then, what do you get? You get the limit, n goes to infinity of n plus 1 times x over 2n plus 1. Yeah, what was my problem? Why have we passed me had a problem with this, huh? What's, well, and what's that limit? Yeah. I do vaguely remember 
having an issue, but I can't remember if it was because we were trying to figure out if there's a different way to do it, or... Is everybody cool with what, what, how that works out yeah. so far? Is that what we did last time? Yeah. And, then, and then what's got to be true about this? So then x has got to be less than 2. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I vaguely remember talking a little bit about... <coughs> know, this problem is, is not that bad. Yes, oh, was the endpoints? Ah, that's what it was. The endpoints. That's right. Now it's coming back to me. So when we check the endpoints out, that's where it freaked out. Because then I get this negative two to the end. I don't know if I'm gonna suddenly realize how to do this. So if I check out uh, x equal to negative two. So this would be, uh, let's see. So just taking out the negative dependence out of there, just so I can look at this directly. And you said we can't like determine whether it works or not. Yeah, it didn't seem to me at the time. Let's look at this real quick. N factorial, a different way you can write N factorial. This happens in a couple of the homework problems, and one of them I keep <coughs> forgetting to bring up. Um, you normally write this as N times N minus 1 times N minus 2, and it's not as useful as doing it the other way. This is 1 times 2 times 3 up to N. Because wouldn't it be N times N minus 1 times N down to 1? So now I'm just writing it the other way. It is actually a much or useful way to write it, right? As we over, one times three times five up to two n minus one. Right, that, that piece by itself. And then I get, so that's that piece, is that cool? Yeah. I, I think I just didn't realize something that I just realized. Two to the n would be two times two times two times two n times, right? All right, cool. Yeah. So, what gets really weird here is um, if you if you look at a few specific examples and you want to see how far up. So one is over one, two is over three, but then the three cancels, right? So several of these cancel, but then it gets a little weird as to what's left. Do you guys see that? <clears throat> I mean, how far up does this really go? I mean, what really would cancel here? So here it would be. Uh, two is left, four is left, six is left, so that's kind of like the reverse of what I was saying. All the even ones down here are missing, so they're what would be left up here, right? But this doesn't go far enough to cover all of the odds. I don't know if you guys see that. So, for example, if, if n was uh, uh, seven, this would be one times two times three times four times five times six times seven. This would be seven twos. Cool. And this would be, uh, what would it go up to? Seven. 2 times 7 13. minus 1 is 13. So it would be 1 times 3 times 5 times 7 times 9 times 11 times 13. So you see how it doesn't, it goes up far enough to kill the 7, but then it can't kill, do anything with these. So there's always going to be a little bit left on the bottom from that. All right, so... Uh, how can I summarize what to look for here very quickly? I wish I would remember this. Because um, now I'm, I'm really curious about this problem. Um, so I do get some of these odds canceling. I do have all these extra twos up here. Right? So I have all these extra twos up here. I'm going to have some, uh, <coughs> let's see. So it really boils down to, is this enough to kill, to can to, um, uh, kind of do something with what's left on the bottom. That's kind of like what it boils down to. But I, I'm not going to try to take up time today. This is obviously not going to be the test. But now I desperately wish I would have done this. Uh, I'm curious where this goes. Uh, I don't know if I want to try to work it out in front of you and take up all your time with this. Uh, but I guess the important thing is to 
there's a couple of homework problems where you, you do stuff like this. You write out a few terms and you see how they line up. There's a couple of them like this in the homework. Uh, so this is a really good kind of uh, general approach to take when you have these weird product rules like this, right? Of course, when I say product rule, I don't mean differentiation. I mean this, this uh, a rule as to how to multiply in the bottom. Um, I'm really, really curious about this. So here, this would be threes, fives, sevens. So you get two, four, six, nine, eleven, thirteen, and I get two to the seventh. Top's bigger. Top's bigger for sure, yeah. But does that trend hold? And if I did a couple more of these, I could maybe see a pattern as to what's left on the top and bottom. Do you, get, do you guys kind of see what I'm saying? At all? I mean, do, do, this all I did here was uh, write out n factorial for what it is, wrote out the, the bottoms written out, wrote those out, and I'm just trying to see it. How do they match up? Do, do, does everything cancel? That would be easy. No. Is there more left on the top and the bottom? I can't tell. Shit. So then I try to do a specific example just to see what would happen. Some is left on the bottom, some is left on the top. The top looks to be bigger than the bottom. If that pattern would hold, then this series would diverge. Yeah. I would think it would hold, yeah. So now the only problem is to actually put that together formally. Now, can you do like one term and then the next term, or like how many terms? The only reason I would ever do this is to try to tell me what to look for to write the proof. This by itself would never prove anything. It just gives me a feel for. So this problem by itself makes me think it's going to diverge, right? So then I, I maybe would do another one just to kind of see is there a pattern to what's going on, so I can rewrite this a different way. So it's very obvious. Like there's some end stuff left up top, but it's constants left on the bottom. That's obvious. It's going to diverge. So I want to play off this to see if there's a pattern so I can know how to rewrite this in general. I know how to do it specifically. How do I do it in general? So this would be like two times four times six up to something. I have to come up with a general term for that. Obviously it's gonna be dependent on if that's odd or even, so that gets really neat. I don't know if you guys are with me. What's gonna be left on top is gonna to be two, four, six. Definitely, right? Just like here was two, four, six. Yeah. All the even stuff would be left up to the last even number. And all these twos are still here. And on the bottom, everything's going to be gone up to a certain point. At some point, it's going to still be there. Just like at here, this 9, 11, 13, we're still there. So I'm trying to figure out, is there a general way to capture what's happening specifically here? So I can see, is there, is there, if it doesn't boil down like n plus 1 over 2, that would be awesome. That diverges, I'm done. Right? But I don't know, I, I gotta figure out how to rewrite this so I can see what's left in general to see if it's gonna diverge or not. But let me not take any more time up with this. Unless you really want to. I, mean, I, I can keep working on this. I, I don't know if you wanna just sit there and watch me do that. Yeah? Uh, could 9, 11, 13 be factors of the product of the numbers in the numerator? Well, no, these will always be made up of they're not going to have any twos in them, and all of these are based off, and like, well, six through nine, they, they go somewhere. But that's, I think, getting too deep into it. Because when you try to think about what's going to happen in general, it's going to be really hard to capture those. Well, this is a piece of that. You don't want to even do that. You want the overarching, these are definitely gone. These are definitely left. Is there more left on the top or the bottom is really what it comes down to. So all this is trying to help me figure out how to rewrite this so I can see what's really, really left. Where? Where's there more left, really, is what it boils down. Can I rewrite this so I can see what? And the weirdness, of course, is, I mean, I can't take this limit directly. There's really no way to take this limit directly. It looks to me like it's gonna diverge just by this example, plus the top has got a factorial and a two to the end. <laughs> And the bottom has an incomplete kind of factorial. So it looks to me like it should diverge. Yes, sir? Um, on your answer key, 
That's all right. Okay. What's up? The, the factorials, you just canceled out the factorial, but there should be n plus 4 on top, and n plus 3 can be. Should be gone. Good. Thank you. All right, so let's do that one again. This is a uh, 5B. All right, so that's just straight up uh, AN plus 1 over AN. So the mistake I made was, for some reason, I thought something would stay alive down here. So what actually happens here? <laughs> yeah, this should totally go away. So you get n plus 4 times... And of course here, n of those cancels, so you just have 3x plus 2. And actually, that's what I wanted to have happen. So in this case, what is the limit? It's going to almost always, almost always be infinity, unless what? Yeah, only if 3x plus 2 is 0. The only way you can have it not go to infinity is if that piece is 0, and that's that one of those three cases. It could either be equal to a, it could be some uh, from something to something, or it could be all real numbers, right? So in this case, it's only going to work if x is negative 2 thirds. And actually, when I first made this practice test, that's why I made this problem that way. And then, of course, when I make the key, I make it a different problem. I want to give you an example where the only answer, there's only one answer. There was no interval. So what do you think the radius of convergence is here? Zero. I love it. It's zero. It's only that one. It's only the center. That's the only value. So when you plug a negative two-thirds in, every element in the sequence would be zero. That's the only way to make this thing converge. So like I said before, it's kind of like called the trivial solution. The easiest way to make an infinite sum go to zero is to make every element zero. zero. Yeah. So I have no idea why I decided n plus 3 would live. I guess I killed so many in my life. I wanted one of them so to survive somewhere. What's really nice about these kind of problems is if it's got a radius of zero, there are no endpoints to test. So then you don't have to worry about those. But thank you for that. So we got that 5B. Something's like not going to go right. So when you test the endpoints, now, now, all right. So let me go back to something somebody said earlier. When you said we couldn't use a ratio test on that problem, it, it, that's not what was said. The endpoints can never have the ratio test apply to them because they come from the ratio test saying, "I don't know what the hell." So as a part of the whole process of finding interval of convergence, radius of convergence, when you use the endpoints, you plug them in, step back, and see what the hell kind of series you got. Because you can't use ratio test. You're more than likely not going to be able to do root test. Most of the time, it's going to be super obvious. Sometimes, remarkably not. But most of the time, they're obvious. Like, it's going to be the sum of one forever. I think we did one like that before. Um, and I would obviously you wouldn't include that, right? 
Uh, let's see. Going to come up with an example very quickly. Yeah, look at this here. So they do a problem, an example problem here. Right, and if you go through all the steps, you end up with uh, x has got to be less than one third. I think it's what I got. Yeah. Right, so if you do the ratio test and all that kind of business, and actually here, you well, no, root test won't quite work because just do down here, but you do the ratio test, you come out to this. So then the endpoints you check would be negative one third and one third. And, it, and looking back, it kind of. One third kind of seems to make some sense because it goes along with this guy. Negative three to the end by himself would do what? No matter what's on the bottom, really. Negative three to the end is going to diverge, right? It goes to infinity a lot quicker than that does. So if x is one third, less than one third, or less than negative one third, what's it going to do together with this? make the result less than one. And of course, then it would be a convergent geometric series, right? If, you, if the inside of this was less than one, that would be obvious. It would be obviously beautiful geometric series. So I'm trying to tell you, why does this answer make sense? From the beginning, the problem here was that's greater than one, depending on what x is. So what x's would make that less than one, anything less than one third, or, or greater than negative one third, right, in there. Together with this, it would make it less than one. You can see that. So if I put in there, uh, one fourth. So I just put a one fourth in there to the end. Together, what is this? what happens here? Yeah, and then, and then forget the negative. Let's look at an absolute value, the absolute convergence. Would that converge? This is only helping me, right? This is only helping me. It's making all my stuff. So don't even look at that. Would that converge? What kind of series is it? Geometric. And R is? Would it converge? Yes, and then of course it would, because I put a number in there that's inside my interval. Anything inside here will end up making this converge. That's the idea, right? That's why they call it the interval of convergence. And that's just an example of why it makes sense that one-third is the dividing line, because when I put a one-third in there, see, this is a nice one. I can kind of check the endpoint without doing much work. If I put a one-third in there together, this becomes like a one. Take the negative out of the way for a second. It just becomes a one. And 1 over the square root of n plus 1 plus would do what? Uh-oh. All right, so let's check. Let's check negative 3 just so I can kill it negative directly. So if I put a 1 third in, I made a negative 1 third, checking that side, so the negatives cancel more directly. But I would take the absolute value of the damn thing anyway. So negative is going to go away. So I get 1 to the n. Now please, I'm not going to necessarily make you do any direct comparison or something crazy. I know that the bottom is basically is 1 over n to the 1 half. And that's a p series where p is, oh shit, what happens for that? Diverges. I love it. p series. P is one half, less than one, diverges. Now, I can completely relate to the idea that ratio and root test need the limit to be less than one in order for it to converge. But the P series, if it's less than one, it diverges. Your brain starts going, oh, shit. <laughs> right? But don't forget, what's a simple example of a P series that converges? Square. 1 over n squared. So you just always go to that to keep that rule straight for P-series. The L stuff is based off of what kind of series? 
Ge beautiful. I keep saying that, and I was hoping that would sink in. It's totally based on geometric series. So that's why L less than 1, just like R has to be less than 1, right? So don't just sit back and passively say it, it converges because you see the less than 1. you got to actively say, I know 1 over n squared converges. It's got to be greater than 1 to converge. Oh, shit, that diverges to keep the rule straight, right? If you want to come up with a song or something, great. I'm not a songwriter. Yes? Oh, yeah, okay. This one sounds like it's going to be really difficult. I don't blame you for believing how it sounds, but it is lying to you. Here's why it's lying to you. Um, one way to kind of look at it, and, and notice how they don't even tell me what an really is. What would you call this definition, this this way of defining a series, uh, a sequence? Recursive. Recursive. I love it. So it's defined based on itself, right? <laughs> so we haven't really looked at how that interacts. And I gave you one problem like this because they interact really, really well with ratio tests. Because what's the ratio test require you to do? What kind of ratio in general? <laughs> well, look at this. A n plus 1 is this times a n. So what's a n plus 1 over a n? That. So recursive formulas, especially when they're, they're a multiplier of that is this, that they're, they're nice and easy. Let them, they're, they're remarkably easy. So this whole thing can be replaced with that, yeah. An plus one divided by an is this business here. And of course, this one you could kind of like go insane with because the cosine, but basically it's uh, a number less than or equal to three divided by something going to infinity, this is definitely going to go to zero. zero. Cool. Is that cool by itself? I mean, the top is bounded and the bottom grows unbounded. So the whole thing is going to go to zero. Top can't keep up. So what does that mean? Yeah, that's less than one. Absolute conversion. Like so that's a problem. It just sounds like it's gonna be horrible. You're like, they don't even tell me what the sequence is. You just give me this stupid little thing. What the hell am I supposed to do that? But the beautiful thing is, it just goes right there and it tells you exactly what to put in. Cool. I like it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um. So what did you try on that there? Okay, I like us. Yeah. So this one looks disgusting also, especially because it's got a factorial squared. But well, we don't care. We've seen factorial times factorial, so I can just rewrite that if I want to as n factorial times n factorial. And treat them like they're two separate things. So how would you test this? It's asking when is what k values would make this convergent. 
All right. So, but I mean, the, the way I do that is to just do the test and see what what are required happen with k to make it work. At the end, I'm going to get some expression with k in it, sort of like what we do with power series. I end up with an expression with x in it, and I see what x has to be. So here, this is not a power series, but I can treat it the same way. So what would it look like trying to set up this uh, ratio test? Yeah, let me write that out twice. Kn plus plus k, right? Because you replace n with n plus one. Cool. Times, of course, the same business up here. Now here's where things get interesting. So this is really the heart of this problem, and let's let's deal with all the other parts of this first uh, before we get to the weirdest. Uh, this is pretty simple here, right? So n plus one times n factorial, n plus one times n factorial. So the n factorials cancel. I left with n plus one, n plus one on the top. All right, that's the not so weird part. Now, now does anybody see why this is weird? Because how many of these do I have to do before I can cancel that? I mean, if it was Kn plus 3, I'd write Kn plus 3 plus K, times Kn plus 2 times Kn plus 1 times Kn. Yeah, the Kn's cancel. I know exactly where to stop. Well, how many do I have to do? K of them. Oh, shit. So here's, here's the part. All right. Let me see if I can. So real quick, if it was... Uh, if it was Kn plus 2, let's just focus on what we're doing right now. If it was Kn plus 2, what would happen on the bottom? What would I do? Kn plus 2 times Kn plus 1 times Kn. Yeah, times Kn, good. Factorial, bam, bam. So then on the bottom, it would, it would the degree would be, the degree of the bottom there is the second degree, right? I had to take 2 off, and I got the second degree. So if I had an n plus 3, I'm going to be left with what degree in the bottom? Third degree. It's kn plus k. So I'm going to be n, I'm going to end up with kn plus something, but it's going to be to the kth degree. All right, I really, of course, it's more like that. k to the k, n to the k. Let me, let me. That's the weirdness for this problem, is to realize it's all about degree now. So the, I, I need this limit to be uh, in between zero and infinity, right? Which means what has to happen for the polynomial pieces that will be left? Their degrees have to be the same. Because if it's zero or infinity, oh wait, I'm, I'm doing the wrong thing. So for the ratio test, what's gotta happen? It's gotta be less than one, to be convergent. There we go. I was applying the wrong test. Uh, so that means the degree in the bottom has to be how related to the degree in the top. To be certain, it has to be bigger, right? Then it would be less than one. If they're equal, then it would be the ratio of the highest coefficients, right? The, high, the, the coefficient of the highest degree terms. How do we do so far? So hopefully, if you've done enough of these factorial problems, you always end up with at least a piece of your limit being polynomials divided by polynomials, and then it's all about degree. If the bottom degree is higher, it's zero. If they're even, it's the ratio. If it, the top is higher, it's infinity. And then it's an easy question to answer, right? So they took that relatively easy problem, and they said, OK, let's investigate this more generally. What would this k have to be so that I end up with the right degree so that I do have convergence, so the discuss come out to be less than 1? So what, what degree do I end up with on the top? Let's see. So this is gone here, right? Just got to finish this out. Blah, 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 kn. This canceled. And I was left with k of these. So I'm left with the kth degree. Is everybody decent with that step right there? For if it was 2, I'm left with 2. So I'm secondary. 3 would be 3. k is k. So if I actually did multiply them all out, I'd end up with kn to the kth plus other crap that we don't really care about because they're smaller degrees. Who cares about them, right? Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe. 
Okay, so what degree do I have on the top? Yeah, I have basically n squared here, right? So it's like n squared plus, who cares? Over kn to the k plus, who cares? Yeah, so if k was 2, they would be equal, but then it, and if k is 2, it would be 1 over 2. Or actually, 1 over 4, because it would be squared, yeah. <coughs> do that again. If k was 2, they would be equal degrees. The limit would be the ratio of the coefficients. 1 over 2 squared is 4. So it would be 1 fourth, which is less than 1. If k was uh, 1, that would suck. All right, so I want to go the other way. So I know 2 seems to be the divine line, and if k was bigger than 2, this obviously converges, because then it would be 0. Right? So it's when the degrees are equal to each other that the weirdness happens. So, so k would have to be greater than or equal to 2. Was that easy? No. Was that based off of something we've done before? Yeah. But it, it, the, the key step here was this, and realizing why it's weird and how to even start analyzing it. And I always kind of think, can I just throw a number in for a second and see what happens? Right? Either give yourself a few uh, specific elements or just throw something in. If, I, if this was a number I knew, I would know what to do with it. Okay, make it a number you know. Make it two, what would happen? Make it three, what would happen? Now that it's K, keep the pattern going. Two, second degree, three, third degree, K, K degree. So if you do enough of these factorials, you should know, you almost always get like N plus one over N or something, and it's all about the degrees. So that's what this whole problem boiled down to is, what degree are you left with? So it has to at least match the degree of what you're left with on the top. Thank God the top was easy. <laughs> the bottom's where all the weirdness was. Okay, you guys love that problem. Can you do um, like Number 20? Or 11.5. There we go. Oh, yeah. Now, if you, if you try to do like a test for divergence, or, or even the first step in alternate series, which one of the two steps is making sure the limit is zero, zero. zero right? So that they kind of go together, which is beautiful. And this is a alternating series, so it kind of makes sense. Um, obviously, would, would this thing converge absolutely? No. Is it so obvious, though? But this is definitely not going to go to zero. So the limit of an is not zero. It's something. I don't know. Well, actually, it's not that obvious, is it? So let's, let's start there. We gotta take this limit and see what the hell it is. So how do I take the limit of this? Jordan's like, dude, that's what I'm asking you. Split it up how? The pro what's the fundamental problem here? What, what form is this in? Infinity minus infinity, which is not zero. It's unknown. If only I had a Locatels only works on a ratio. And of course, the minute you think that, or maybe the minute you see radicals with a minus, you think conjugate. Which is really weird for some of us, because we're like, it doesn't even have a bottom. What the hell am I doing a conjugate for? Well, let's see why. So what do you get? I get n plus 1 minus n, so it's 1. Well, that looks good. Over at that business here. And now it's easy as hell, right? 
Beautiful. Right. So this is definitely going to be zero. And see the, the trick with the conjugate, the problem was it was minus. The conjugate's going to do as a plus. Now it's not going to be an indeterminate form anymore. Because now it's infinity plus infinity on the bottom. Well, that's going to freaking zero. Even faster. Right? Now, now this by itself, what does it tell me? It could converge. Right? So I can finish out the alternating series test. And in fact, this is in that section, right? This is before we knew about yeah. absolute. Yeah. I've learned my lesson about it. Look at where the hell I am. Um, so yeah, this is beautiful. So I don't have to worry about absolute convergence. I know I brought it up because we know it. But in this section, I don't have to worry about it. We don't know about it yet. I just have to worry about alternating series tests. So what's the only other thing I have to show? Decreasing. If it's decreasing. I love it. So you've rewritten this to make the limit easier. We'll use this to make this question easier too. So it's one over something that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger that's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. You could basically just write exactly that. That's fine. I'm going to start to be a little bit less picky about, like, uh, you know, if I saw this, Unless I say specifically use uh, direct comparison test. If I just say, like, if this is part of this, why can't you just say it obviously does not converge absolutely? Because it's trying to be 1 over n. Cool. I'm going to finally allow you to just say that. All right. You have to go through the earlier stuff, though, to realize you've got to be careful. Because sometimes you think it's obvious when it's not. But this is one of them. It's very obvious. So you could just say, I'm going to test conditional, absolute won't work, it's trying to be 1 over n, that's divergent. I love it. Kick ass. Right, some guys look at me. I'm crazy. I'm used to that. Look. Yes, sorry. Which, sorry? 36. Oh, yes. All right. Uh, all right. I'll tell you this. Um, somewhere I have done this problem, and I want to write it better and just give you a copy of it. There's no need, really, to go through this. <laughs> the reason I, I gave it to you uh, was just to see if the fact that you have to use induction would come to anybody. If that would just kind of, if, if you could tell at least that it required induction. And, and how could I possibly tell that this requires induction? I mean, what, what in there tells me that it might require induction? So I'm trying to show that this is true. This is number 36, seven, uh, sorry, 11, five, right? So I'm trying to prove this. And what are each of these? Each of these are sums, right? Each of those are partial sums. S was the partial sum for the alternating series, and HN was the partial sum of the harmonic. And, and the basic idea of math induction is this sum equals this expression. And then you just add the next term on to show that it does. So this definitely would require math induction to do. Right. All right. So, if you will just permit me to do this, uh, let me see if I remember this. Maybe somebody can email. Uh, I have to find out. I sat down and I actually worked this problem out, and then I couldn't find the damn thing. Uh, but it's in my office in uh, stack. Maybe it's even right here. Um, no. True. Uh, but I'll write it out better and give you a little copy of it, just so you can have it just so I can finally kill this problem and lay it to rest. Put it down, you can even take the paper I give you, just dig a shallow grave. Um, <laughs> and I know, yes. so as a student, it's hard to understand why, I mean, I, I wanted to give this problem, like I said, just to see if anybody could tell induction was required. The minute you realize induction is required, I wanted to see if anybody could try to put together what the next step would be. This is not a simple problem. There's a lot of problems in this book that aren't simple. 
And very often, the only thing I really want to be able to see from somebody is, could you see what, it was, what you needed to do the problem, and could you try to start setting it up? I don't even necessarily expect you to be able to finish the damn thing when I sign these problems. I just want to see, can you see what they even try to do? Um, and it, it refers back to an earlier problem for, for finishing it out, right? Okay, but that's not going to, that kind of thing will not show up on the test. So again, I don't want to waste time trying to recreate the proof now. Yeah. So is it the error part of it? Okay. So, with alternating series or almost any series, really. So this one says, you know, show that it converges. Why is this so desperately, definitely going to converge? Well, even be more specific, that's not enough for a series. That's enough to say a sequence is going to converge, but not to say the series will, right? Because 1 over n, the bottom grows, but that doesn't converge, that's series. So take that away. That's making things even better to converge, isn't it? If I divide by n, it's going to be even easier. So even if I take that away, what's left? Uh, Geometric. Geometric, where r is less than 1. Less than 1. It's 1 fifth, yeah. And then putting that in is like even you know better in a way almost, right? It's going to be even smaller. It's going to be easier, whatever you want to call it. It's going to converge even more. Um, so that part should be easy. The error part gets a little weird. So they want to have the error be less than 0. 0.0001. Yep. So here's the beautiful thing about this. Uh, if you write a few of these elements out, somebody help me out. So so let's figure out what's a one going to be. Thanks for helping. And what's A2 going to be? Yes, 150th, which was negative 2, right? I'm sorry, the first one was negative. Right? This one's positive, 0 0.02. You get 150th there, right? Which will be 200, which so is 0.02. A3 is, yeah, so if you put a 3 in there, you get uh, 3 times uh, 125. So it's, it's roughly, who, who what, who do you get? 1 over 325. And then make that a decimal for me. You. Now, do you see how we keep moving over a decimal place? So every time I, so now, uh, if I wanted to be good out to the second place, I only have to go here. Because then the next term is only going to screw up with the next place. Now, now I do have to be a little bit careful with that because uh, here the sum is 0.2. Here the sum is, what's S2? No, 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 S2. 0.22. Right. Get away from fractions, trust me. It's really hard to see patterns very often with fractions. S3. I'm sorry. It's negative. My bad. So it'll be point, negative point 0.18 there, right? Negative point 0.2 plus point 0.02? All right, thank you. Speak up. And S3. So negative point 0.18 plus this. Now they're both negative, so that's easy enough. Yeah, cool. And, of course, I bet you anything that the next one's going to be in this decimal place, right? So it won't, whatever it is, it won't screw with the decimal place before it most of the time. You just got to be a little careful. So what I was kind of hoping would happen didn't here. But you can could, you could sometimes have, like, uh, if this is 0 0.06 and the next one is minus 0 0.004, well, now it's 0 0.056, so that did change. You see, it went from 6 to 5. Right, so you'd have to go one more step out. So what you normally do is you go, all right. If I want to go out to the to be accurate to within 0 0.0001, 
I'm going to go until I get a, uh, a sequence element that's in the place after that. Because then it won't screw with the place before it. So right now I'm out to the 0.003. I just got to keep going. A4 would be positive 0. 0.000 something. I'll bet you anything. I don't know what it is. Because it's too much in my head. Getting a headache. Because I'm trying to do it. Yeah, it's like some. Okay. I think it's four there. All right. I got so many bigger switch in there. Yes. Uh, and then A5 is going to be 0 0.0000 something. Seven? Yeah, it's either two, three, four, five. Why not? Let me need if that was true. So you guys have calculators, right? Could anybody possibly help me? Could you guys help me? Help, help me out. You don't have to give me a quarter. It's just work. Give me a calculator. Zero. Do it again. How many zeros?